probably ought to get a whoo after that. <laughs> Amen. I remember the first time I heard that song, there was a group in our church and they, they sang that song. I downloaded it on iTunes and used to play it in the truck for my daughter, who Katie just would love that song. She'd give a big smile. You play a bunch of other songs, but boy, when she heard that one, she'd smile from ear to ear. And I think she's up there in heaven right now just singing away. Uh, just praising her Jesus, so amen, amen, yeah, amen. Wow, well, the music team here did a great job in the first service, but I think they even ramped it up here for the second service. That was really amazing. So uh, we're ready to worship the Lord. I do have to, to mention for those uh, of you Super Bowl fans that uh, my congratulations <coughs> are in order for the Eagles. Um, yeah, they really showed up, played well. Congratulations, Eagle fans. Yep, yep. The Eagles fly. Tom's got that. Oh, my stars. Patriots are such losers. Ugh. <laughs> All right, we're in 2 Corinthians. Enough is enough. It was a good fight, Ma, but we lost. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and we are talking about the foolishness of the Apostle Paul. The foolishness of the Apostle Paul, and the message this morning here in chapter 11 is one of the more countercultural messages that you're going to find in Scripture. Without a doubt, it runs against the way I think almost entirely. And by the time we come to the end of chapter 11, it is a weight of, of conviction that falls upon my heart as I look at this amazing passage of Scripture. The Apostle Paul, as you know, has been in contest with the false teachers who are there in Corinth. And as he is trying to defend himself, it would seem that the Apostle Paul would count on the achievements and the blessings and the testimony that he has. And yet what we find here is just the opposite. For the Apostle Paul, instead of trying to build himself up in the eyes of those in Corinth, instead he points to his weakness and he says, here are my weaknesses. And I would rather, he says, instead of boasting in my great deeds, he says, I want to boast in my weaknesses. That is something there that goes countercultural to us, and it certainly went countercultural to the people in Corinth. For the Apostle Paul is writing this in the midst of a culture that knew nothing of that type of spirit whatsoever. In fact, they would find themselves, uh, without a doubt, trying to build themselves up. In Caesar's work, Res Gaste, there was the cultural model given, and that cultural model for these false apostles to self-promote their vitas read like this. Here's an example of one actual vita. I have six letters from prominent people in Athens and Rome who extol my virtues. Three times I've spoken before the imperial legates, and once I was received by Pompey. Twice I have received honoraria beyond my peers. In every quarter I am esteemed. And that is not the message that the apostle Paul is giving. Rather, in verse 1 he says, I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Allow me to present an argument, he says, that's just a little foolish. But my God, I want to boast about, I boast about him in my weakness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for the blessings that you have given to us. Father, the Apostle Paul is such an example. Your word is such an example. May we take it to heart this morning. And may you do a work in all of our lives, Father. May we be similar to the Apostle Paul in that we would only boast in our weakness. I pray this all in Christ's precious name. Amen. As we look at this passage of Scripture, we're going to see several different things here with regard to the Apostle Paul. Well, I think we're off on a song. And uh, I could start singing, I guess. But uh, <laughs> where, oh, where did my PowerPoint go? It's really weird. Everything's gone really well this morning with the time changes and everything. I'm looking at the clock and I'm thinking, 11.29, I have 15 minutes. Then I realize we started at 11. <laughs> so that's good. All right, so here we are. Paul's foolishness is on display in the following ways. I want to give you four ways that the Apostle Paul's thinking just really doesn't measure up to the way in which 
wise thinking that's prevalent in our day would measure it. In other words, we're looking at something that the world would say does not make any sense whatsoever. Pick this up with me here where the Apostle Paul says, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. And he gives an example of marriage. He says, I have betrothed you or engaged you to one husband so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. And so here we are in the very beginning, the Apostle Paul, as we see, he is not striving for his own personal goals, but rather he has subjected himself to the will of God. He is looking at what God's will is, and he understands that it is God's will that he would do a work in these churches and so be able to present the church as the bride of Christ, one who is pure, as a virgin is pure. He says, this is my role. But he says, I'm very concerned that you might be deceived, deceived by the same Uh, for Satan himself who deceived Eve, and you would lack the devotion that is necessary. He is calling the Corinthians to a higher devotion, a greater love, albeit, for Jesus Christ. And what we're finding here is that Paul is able to see the big picture. You know, I've as I've gone through scripture for years and years and years, I've never seen it exactly this way that it would be your role and your desire to simply present this local body to Jesus Christ as one that is without blame, holy. I've never really thought of it that way, but I find it curious that the Apostle Paul thinks exactly that way. He says the same thing, in essence, in Ephesians chapter 5. Christ loved the church, and he gave himself for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. That is the desire of of the Apostle Paul. He says this is what we're supposed to be all about. Now, as the church, I would understand the church are people of faith, people who have called upon the name of the Lord and been saved. They have had that transformation that has taken place, and that taking place has happened from Pentecost and will continue to happen all the way up to the rapture of the church. It is all of us who are part of the body of Christ. We're part of that universal church, believers, where the Holy Spirit of God is dwelling within us. And as such, I understand that God has a plan for my life. And his plan is that I might become more and more like Jesus Christ. And so I will be presented ultimately without a sin nature after the rapture before the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will be having been bought with the blood of Christ. I will be holy and blameless before him. Now that's pretty interesting, isn't it? The apostle Paul is saying we have a work to do even before then. We want people to come to faith and that we want their faith to grow. We want them to be walking in righteousness, living in the light, and displaying a Christ-likeness as they live their life. The Apostle Paul had that as his goal. He could have a lot of goals. Could have had a lot of goals. He could have a lot of personal agendas. But this doesn't seem to be a part of the big picture that he sees and notices. Paul's foolishness is also on display in a second way. Paul's going to put aside his rights, and he's going to allow God to provide for his needs. Paul goes on as he's writing this, and he talks about his relationship there with the Corinthians. And I want you just to see there in verse 7, he says, Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted? Because I preached the gospel of God to you without charge. Huh. Now, interestingly, if you go back to the days of the Corinthian church, you're going to find that there were great orators who would command all kinds of big money to speak. I mean, big money. I don't know how much it would equate to us today, but there are speakers today, even in Christian circles, that demand huge amounts of money. If you've ever gone online, you can actually go online and you can see what speakers get for each engagement. And it's not unusual to see on the lower side of the spectrum $10,000, $15,000 for one speech. Paul is saying, I didn't charge you. Of course, he's not going to charge them, but it was the right thing to do. He was not going to call upon them and say that I must be paid. 
Now, interestingly, he is going to correspond uh, with the others who are there, and he does this in verse 5. He says, I consider myself not in the least inferior to the most eminent apostles. I like the Holman edition. It says super apostles. In other words, the super apostles were the ones in Corinth. These were the guys that were really knocking it out of the park. These were the guys who were really good speakers. These were the guys who had all of their stuff all together, and you really would flock to hear them speak. And they would demand big checks at the end of the day. And the Corinthian church would cut them a check because, after all, they had a lot of money in Corinth. Paul says, I didn't take any money. I didn't charge anything. But I'm not inferior, Paul says. I'm not inferior to the super apostles because I have more knowledge than they do. I might not be able to speak. Look in your Bible there. He says, I might not be able to speak as well as they do. I might not have all the skills that they have. But he says, I have more knowledge, and so I'm not inferior to them. And then based upon the establishment that he is not inferior to them, he says, and I'm not charging you when I speak. I'm not charging you for writing an epistle and uh, allowing God to use it. I'm not calling on you to do that. Now let me ask you, how many here think the Corinthian church was rich? Raise your hand. You'd be right. The Corinthian church was poised in such a place that they had all kinds of commerce in and out of there. The trade was through the roof. I mean to tell you, the GMP was amazing. 10% or more, sure about it. I don't know that for sure. But I'm sure the the GMP had to be good. These people were rolling in it. And they were giving those big-time speakers big-time checks. And this is what Paul says, and it blows my mind here in this passage. Paul says, I was not a burden to anyone when I was there. Notice this, he says in, in this verse uh, 9. He says, for when the brethren came from Macedonia, they fully supplied my need in everything. And I kept myself from being a burden to you and will continue to do so. Let me ask you this question. How many here think the Macedonians were rich? Yeah, yeah. In fact, you go back to chapter 8, and the Bible says that they were afflicted in their deep poverty, and yet they first gave of themselves, and then they gave to the work uh, of gathering the money to go to Jerusalem, where they were dealing with a famine, and the Macedonians had come along to the side of the apostle Paul and said, please let us give. These same poor Macedonians are the ones who are coming in and giving the money now to the apostle Paul. You see that? God is able to use people in amazing ways. Paul says, I didn't take the money from you, even though you could have afforded to give it. Instead, God used some of the Macedonians to rise up. And I'm sure the Apostle Paul wasn't getting rich because those people were in their deep affliction, but it was enough for him to be able to get by. And he says, I did that because I did not want to be a stumbling block to you who are in Corinth. I don't want you to think that that because you're giving me money, I'm beholden to you. You need to hear the truth. And the truth is in greatest essence here. They needed to hear it. So Paul says, my foolishness, I had that money coming to me. In fact, we're going to see here in uh, 1 Timothy, he says, the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. The apostle Paul had the the right biblically to be able to take the money to, to, to get by and live life from the Corinthians. But he says, I'm going to push that aside and not take advantage of that because I don't want you to stumble. And there was no doubt a variety of reasons. You say, this guy's not too bright. He doesn't have any personal goals. He doesn't take money that he should be entitled to. He's looking at this big picture thing about glorifying God all the time. Hmm. Let's see what else he sees. You'll notice here his foolishness is on display as well because he doesn't respond to these uh, Corinthians with a personal attack. I want you to see here in verse 12, he says, what I'm, con- what I'm doing, I'll continue to do so that I may cut off opportunity for those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the manner about which they are boasting. He says, for such men are false apostles. They're deceitful workers. They're disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. These super apostles, what Paul is saying is, they're really not apostles at all. They're disguising themselves. And he goes on and he says, no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. 
Therefore, it's not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. Let's get this straight. Satan, when he was created, was the head honcho under, uh, over the angels, right? He's the number one angel. His name, if you remember, was Lucifer. He is the brightest bulb. He is the most powerful of the angels. And he is going on and on about how he's an angel of light. Well, we know that he exalts himself against God, and he wants to have the throne, and he's cast down, and he is now confirmed in his unrighteousness. And because of that, the lake of fire is prepared for him and the other fallen angels. That's what the scripture says. He is very, very good at disguising himself as he was prior to the fall. That is an angel of light. He's able to do those things in an amazingly effective way, and the servants that are following him also disguise themselves as these false angels of light. We live at a time where these false teachers are in abundance, and we live in a day when it's hard to tell the players apart at times. Recently, I won't, uh, I won't uh, let them know who this is, but um, they were shopping, a young lady in our church, and they were over here in a store, and uh, they ran into some people who were, who were of a strange belief. It turns out they're the World Missionary Society Church of God. Anybody else run into them this week? This poor girl not only ran into them once, she ran into them more than once in the same store. And then she had some literature under her wiper, I understand as well, mercy me. So, so what do they believe? Well, these people were going around, they go around the shopping malls, stores, they go door to door, and they're out there canvassing. They're a Korean feminist cult that began in South Korea in 1964. You see, they believe in God the Father and also God the Mother. And they believe that they are restoring the truth of the early church. They claim that all their teachings are based upon the Bible, but they have additional writings from this one woman who uh, was a leader in this, this cult. And, oh, by the way, she is the mother God. So that's convenient. And then somebody else she knows is father God. That's convenient, too. Well, you look at that and you say to yourself, oh, that's stupid. I mean, who's going to go diving into that one? Well, that might be an obvious one, and hopefully no one will. But there are more subtle ones. There are mu ones that are much more subtle than that. Someone sent me a, a link this week to a church that does apologetics. And I was looking at this, this link, and there was an interview with the pastor of this church with someone who I recently heard at a conference. Not this last conference, it was a different conference. And I was listening to the dialogue, and what really got my attention was the headliner of this, this two-minute interview, and it was, uh, should we divide over hell? Hmm. I was interested in that. So I press play, and here's this man, and I'm reading his book right now, okay? That's the worst part. I got it free, so that's not too bad, right? Well, at least I didn't pay for it. If I paid for it, I'd be mad. <laughs> But I'm reading this book that he co-authors with someone else who I really, really respect. And I'm listening to this man. I've listened to him in person. I thought he was dynamite. He's an apologist. He's fantastic. And I'm listening to them going back and forth as to whether or not they think hell is literally eternal. Well, it might be annihilation. Because John 3.16 says, uh, you know, believe in me, you, you'll not perish. Well, that's perish must be annihilation versus eternal life. Heaven is on and on. And they asked him, and he's talking, he says, well, it's not like this is a cardinal doctrine like the deity of Christ. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, where in the world did we get sideways on the doctrine of hell? Well, it may, it may not be altogether eternal. It may be just like temporary and, oh, like purgatory? Where have I heard that? And, and you know, uh, he goes on and he's talking about this. He says, well, this isn't really a cardinal doctrine and we shouldn't be dividing over this. He names some theologian as this is a great theologian. He believed in annihilation. I look him up, he's Anglican, and I'm sitting there going, okay, why am I even listening to this guy? 
If there's no literal eternal hell, do you understand how big a deal this is? I mean, this is a major Christian. He's got a TV program on every week. I go to a very, 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 very conservative pastor's conference where I really, really, really trust the speakers. And he's debating the eternality of hell. If hell's not eternal, we need to take the track rack down. If hell's not eternal, we need to just fold up the missions program. There's no point. Why would I want to go all the way around the world to China and try to teach when they could throw me in prison or worse for doing that if indeed all you're really missing out on is a big party? I mean, let's redo our track record. Let's put in their party invitations. We want you to put your faith in Jesus, so you go up there and we're going to have this great meal and we're going to jam out on harps. I mean, is that what it is? I've always believed that the scripture and Jesus' teachings, and I don't know how you get around it, Jesus taught over and over again about eternal damnation. This is what's motivated us. We've been motivated to share the love of Christ so that people will not spend an eternity in hell. This has been the backbone of the church. Our love extends to the world so that the world might know Christ and not be in a position to receive eternal damnation that Jesus talked about. And here you have major people, major players, people that are being listened to and they are, they are disguised in essence as light, but the message isn't true. And the last time I checked, the scripture says that uh, father of lies, who is it? Satan. He's the father of lies. So even a well-meaning Christian who teaches something contrary to the scriptures as cardinal a doctrine as hell is, and I would believe and submit to you that it's very important, is disguised as an angel of light. (coughs) Things haven't changed. It's just become more and more clever as time has gone on. The message is, is mostly good. You'd like to hear, I mean, this is an apologist and he's coming out. His name's Frank Turek. I'm just so disappointed. We need to be wise, don't we? Paul is saying, it's not personal. We're up against a spiritual enemy who is very crafty and we need to be careful. The fourth point this morning deals with the apostle Paul as the Apostle Paul is going to go on, and I'm going to hopefully get this thing to move. The Apostle Paul refused to make a big list of his personal achievements. I want you to notice here in this passage uh, some of the points that I want to read right here. Picking this up in verse 21, Paul says, but in whatever respect anyone else is bold, I speak in foolishness. I speak in foolishness. I am just as bold myself. Are they Hebrews? He says, so am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. Did you get that? Paul says, I speak as if I'm insane. The apostle Paul is being accused of insanity all along the way. And then he comes out with this argument that is just absolute foolishness, and now people think to themselves, he really has lost it. You see, the Apostle Paul, it makes all kinds of sense. Why doesn't the Apostle Paul step before the Corinthians and say, let me tell you about my life. I was raised in a wealthy home, thank you very much. I had one of the best teachers who've ever lived, and that man's name is Gamaliel. I raised to the ranks of Pharisee. I raised to the ranks of the chief persecutor of the church. I did all these things and yes God appeared to me on the Damascus road how many of you can say that he appeared to you and you were oh my how many could say oh I preached all the word of God and churches were started all across Macedonia and all the miracles and the healings that I've seen done oh the apostle Paul he could have quite a list couldn't he but notice the list that he builds he says I spoke as if I'm insane I'm more so in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death, 
Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've spent in the deep. He was a day and a half swimming in the water either before he got to shore or before he was rescued. A day and a half. I've been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there's the daily pressure uh, of me having concern for the churches. Well, it sounds like he's had a pretty easy life. Paul builds this list and he says, look at the weaknesses. Look at the opportunities that I have had to be able to suffer for the Lord. He doesn't doesn't list his accomplishments. He lists all the things that he was privileged to suffer for Jesus in. Now this runs totally counterculture to our thinking. As a church, we're not interested in this type of thought. We want everything to be as comfortable as possible. I can't read this without being convicted. From pastors to missionaries to everybody in between, there is a desire to be comfortable. Can you imagine what it would be like if you were standing in heaven? I I just envision myself standing in heaven with my own list. After Paul gets through reading his list, I sit there and I think, well, I, I've been yelled at twice in 35 years as a pastor. I mean, it was horrible. I had one lady in the nursery get really, really mad at me. I had some people say some mean things about me. I remember walking up to somebody's house in Syracuse and they hadn't plowed their sidewalk and I was in snow way over my dress shoes. I remember going to a potluck dinner. I could not find anything that I really wanted to eat. (laughs) If I was standing before the Lord and, and Paul gives his list and I had that scrawny list, I don't know if I could cut it up into enough pieces and tear it up so that Jesus wouldn't see it. You see, what we're prepared to do is we're prepared to stand before the Lord someday and say, well, I taught Sunday school for 50 years. Amen. That is good. That is good. I'm not minimizing that. But this isn't the kind of list that Paul has. Are you with me? I don't know how much more convicting this passage could be. Because again, we won't serve if we're not comfortable most of the time. Paul says, here's my weaknesses. Here they are. And this is what I boast in. Flip the page if you need to. Here in verse 30, I want you to see, he says, if I have to boast, Paul says, I'm going to boast of what pertains to my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, he who is blessed forever, knows that I'm not lying. Curious thing to write. A really curious thing to write. But he says, in Damascus, the ethnarch under Artius, the king, was guarding the city of the Damascus in order to seize me, and I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall, and so I escaped his hand. Well, that's interesting. Paul says, I was let down uh, there through the, the, the window, and he said, basically, I'm lowered like a catch of dead fish in a basket whose smelly cargo he had displaced. In effect, Paul views the incident in Damascus really as a paradigm of his life. Remember where he's converted, where he starts off, everything seems to be going great, and here he is now being lowered down in the window. And an even in more interesting aspect here is in the mind of the Roman Corinth uh, individual, he would have been very familiar with the wall crown. The wall crown. In Latin, it's the corona moralis, and it was awarded to brave soldiers who were the first men to go over the wall during the siege of an enemy city. Gellius writes, he says, the mural crown is that which is awarded by a commander to a man who is first to mount the wall and force his way into an enemy town. Paul's being lowered down a wall points to his great humiliation. 
It was the opposite of what the Roman Corinthian would have thought was worthy of praise. And Paul is humbled. But in that humility, Paul is willing to turn and say, it's all about exalting him. And what Paul does is he sets us up because there's not really a natural chapter break anywhere in the scriptures and it's gonna take us right into the next part here in chapter 12. Do you want me just to go for another hour or do you wanna come back next week? Paul's humility is amazing. He looks at his weakness and he uses his weakness as an opportunity to praise the Lord. And it is so important that we see the significance of this. The scripture says, for consider your calling, brethren, that not many wise were chosen according to the flesh and the money, uh, mighty and many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that are strong. And the base things of the world and despised by God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. His desire is that none of us would boast before him. Again, the humility of Paul is absolutely breathtaking. Stop and think of a couple of things that I can leave you with here. I think they're in your handouts. Paul's drive is consistent and it's pure. You and I need to ask ourselves, what is our motivation? Is it pure? Is it honest? Are we truly seeking God's will or are we trying to build ourselves up? You see, that is the difference between Paul in, in that culture there running countercultural in Corinth and us today running countercultural in our day. Paul's weaknesses were in essence his true strength. We have to ask ourselves, are we willing to endure suffering for the Savior? Would we accept less from the Christian life and still push onward? It's a fair question to ask, isn't it? And it goes back to the early part of chapter 11 where Paul says, I'm concerned that you've been deceived and lack then the devotion you should have to God. What is your devotion to God like? And if you were to make a list in light of chapter 11, what would you put down? Let's pray. This passage is very humbling and it runs contrary to the way we think. And I would submit to you this morning that there are many who think that truly salvation can be procured through works. And yet God's word would say it's not of works lest any man should boast. It is through faith in Jesus Christ and that alone. And if you're here this morning and you've yet to answer the question as to where will you spend your eternity... What are you trusting in? Are you certain that you're on your way to heaven? That is the greatest question before you now. My question is, would you put your faith in Jesus Christ and in him alone? Maybe you're here this morning and you say, well, Pastor Kevin, I've, I've answered that. I've placed my faith in Christ. Dare I ask you the question, what would your list look like? for truly strong in weakness. I encourage us to stop and think about the motivation in our heart for serving Jesus Christ. I believe that there needs to be, as the scripture says, a great simplicity, a simplicity in our devotion to Jesus. We are simplistically devoted to him. If you're here this morning and God's speaking to your heart, my desire is that you would yield to him and simply be devoted as a follower of his.
I wonder if there's anyone here this morning who's not sure about their eternal destination. If you're here this morning and that's still a burden on your heart, the care and concern team will be here at the front. Please come up and talk to them. Let them show you from the scriptures how you can know that you have eternal life. Father, we thank you for truly, Lord, you are the reason why we're here. You are the reason for our lives. You are the reason for the motivation in our hearts. Help us, Father, to be fully devoted to Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, to travel the pathway that you intend for us. Help us, Father, to push aside our own comfort and our own benefits, and Lord, help us to to serve you. Lord, work in our hearts, I pray, and if there's anyone here this day who's not sure about their eternal destination, may they truly be sure before leaving here this morning. May they come to faith in Christ and know the gift of eternal life. Work in our hearts, I pray, Father, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.